Good afternoon, viewers. I hope you're all doing well. Coming to you from South Carolina today, came back home to deal with a family crisis, and it was because of folks like you that I was able to do it at all. So I owe you guys one thank you so much. In the meantime, as many of you have probably heard, Blue Origin has done it again. Even though the only evidence that we have ever seen of New Glenn taking to the skies have been in this one animation, Blue Origin has now secured extremely high profile and very lucrative contracts with the U.S. military to provide geosynchronous satellite launch services for the U.S. Space Force and other parts of the military. This is an extremely high profile contract, one that is not easy at all to secure, one that has up to this point been split between SpaceX and United Launch. Alliance, and now Blue Origin and New Glenn have the opportunity to bid on these future missions, and will most probably get equal consideration for these missions in the future, once again, even though they have never made it to orbit. So is there any method to this madness, or is it just the government throwing Jeff Bezos a bone again so he doesn't sue them? We're going to find out right now. So let's examine what the U.S. military is really looking for in a launch provider by checking out this amazing Falcon Heavy launch of USS F-67, one of the most valuable missions that the Space Force has ever entrusted to SpaceX, just to see what is necessary for these kinds of missions and how well the SpaceX stable of rockets measures up. The reason Falcon Heavy is used for these types of deployments and not Falcon 9 is because these satellites are big and heavy and they require direct deployment into geosynchronous orbit. It's not enough to put them into geosynchronous transfer orbits. The military wants these things dropped off directly in geosynchronous orbits to be deployed and operational immediately. Falcon 9, even when fully expended, can't do this. And as a matter of fact, neither can Falcon Heavy unless you expend the core booster. Only the strap-on boosters can be reused in missions like this. You need to keep all the fuel that's at your disposal, at least in the core stage, in order to get the satellite up to the necessary trajectory to achieve a geosynchronous orbit right away. And that is something that only Falcon Heavy can do. Indeed, even in the future, Starship is not going to be able to do this either. Starship requires a lot of refueling in low Earth orbit, and it's so heavy that achieving higher orbits without refueling is virtually impossible. Falcon Heavy is going to remain SpaceX's go-to rocket when it comes to these types of missions. But fortunately, since you get to reuse these strap-on boosters, and even the booster you're expecting spending can be boosters that were used on previous Falcon 9 missions that really cuts down the cost substantially. So why is SpaceX not the primary contractor here? Why does ULA get 60% of the missions? Actually, that's dropped off a little bit recently because Vulcan Centaur took so long to reach active service, the U.S. Space Force started to give more missions to SpaceX and fewer to ULA, although ULA still has the majority of these missions. But why? Doesn't SpaceX significantly undercut ULA's costs on these things? Well, actually, not really. Even though Falcon Heavy is reusing at least the strap-on boosters, and again, as I said, even the core booster is not really being wasted because it was used before, 
there is one other factor that jacks up the price on these contracts, and that is the military's desire for an extended fairing. Right now, Falcon Heavy's fairing is the same fairing that Falcon 9 uses, and that's not big enough for some of the payloads that the military wants to use. And so as a result, in order to secure these contracts, Elon had to guarantee that Falcon Heavy would eventually have an extended fairing, which by the way, it still doesn't have. And the cost of developing this fairing, which is pretty significant, is actually passed on to the government. So that means every time SpaceX bids on these contracts, they're including the cost of extended fairing development in the overall bid. And consequently, strange as this might sound, the first two NSSF missions that ULA bid on came in at roughly the same price as the first mission that SpaceX secured with the government. ULA got two missions for the cost of one SpaceX mission as a result of these fairing costs. Now, of course, that's not going to last forever, but at the moment, it makes ULA quite competitive. Another thing that makes ULA competitive is the configuration of their rockets. Even though it is a spectacular and wonderful thing to see these boosters get reused on Falcon Heavy, it changes the way that the payloads are are deployed. Unlike the SpaceX reusable model, the Vulcan Centaur utilizes all of its fuel, plus the solid rocket boosters of course, in order to achieve 170 kilometers worth of altitude before the core stage actually reaches main engine cutoff. That means that the rocket and the payload have already achieved very, very high altitude before the second stage even cuts in. And Falcon has Heavy does the same thing when it expends its core stage. So reusability requires LEO optimization on the boosters because you need to keep the fuel in reserve in order to get the boosters back and also you need to have main engine cutoff a lot earlier in the process. Now, of course, the disadvantage to this is that Vulcan Centaur is expending the entire rocket in this process, and that, of course, is very wasteful, although their model of what is called smart reusability, where they are going to jettison the engines after the core stage cuts off and utilizing a hypersonic re-entry shield called the lofted the engines will be protected from re-entry and will splash down in the ocean where they will be recovered actually the idea of parafoil recovery catching the engines with helicopters has been abandoned because the lofted is perfectly buoyant once again it's already been tested seems like a very promising technology so this allows ULA to integrate reusability into the design and still have geosynchronous optimization instead of LEO optimization. So, in many ways, the Vulcan Centaur is specifically designed for these types of missions. It's almost as if ULA is really trying to target these U.S. Space Force missions to make a rocket that is perfectly suited for deploying extremely large and heavy payloads directly into geosynchronous orbit. However, strangely enough, the vast majority of Vulcan Centaur missions in the future are actually going to be dedicated towards deploying Kuipers. And of course, Kuiper satellites are usable only in low Earth orbit, so that seems to be a strange use for the Vulcan Centaur, but really the only reason that it's being used for this purpose is because Jeff Bezos is not going to do business with SpaceX unless he is absolutely forced to. He has a few missions utilizing Falcon 9 to deploy Kuiper, but that was only to get rid of a lawsuit from some of Amazon's shareholders. The majority of these missions are being carried out by non-SpaceX companies because Jeff Bezos, of course, has this long and vicious rivalry with Elon Musk. Regardless of how these guys may behave in public, behind the scenes, they are definitely feuding factions. That being the case, though, 
What does Blue Origin bring to the table? I mean, what sort of advantage do they have? Well, one of the biggest advantages is the fairing size of New Glen. New Glen has a bigger fairing, much bigger actually, with a 7 meter diameter than Vulcan Centaur or the extended fairing for Falcon Heavy. Only Starship has a bigger fairing than New Glen. But because New Glen is a much lighter rocket than Starship, being constructed of far are more advanced and lightweight materials than stainless steel, New Glen can achieve higher altitudes than Starship can. As you can see from this graph, Starship is actually incapable of delivering any payload into TLI, translunar injection that is, whereas New Glen can deliver 8.5 metric tons. Now, geosynchronous orbit, we don't have all the data on that, but it's very likely that it's going to be able to deploy about 20 to 25 percent less payload than a direct geosynchronous insertion from Vulcan Centaur and definitely substantially less than Falcon Heavy as well. So what's the advantage? Well, it's still the fairing size. If there are some very large satellites or perhaps some sort of small scale automated space stations that the Space Force would like to deploy into geosynchronous orbit, New Glenn would be the ideal rocket for that. It has a lot of volume at its disposal, just not as much mass as Falcon Heavy or Vulcan Centaur. And again, the reason for that is it does have a lot of engines, seven of those BE-4s, but without the solid rocket boosters, it just doesn't have the capability of delivering as much mass up to geosynchronous orbit. And of course, Falcon Heavy has an enormous amount of thrust being delivered by three Falcon 9 core stages, so it can deliver more mass. The only real advantage that New Glenn has is that volume. Oh yes, and also reusability, of course. Assuming that New Glenn can deliver a competitive amount of payload up to geosynchronous orbit and still reuse the booster, well, that would make a tremendous amount of difference. Although I have to admit, I kind of have my doubts about that. If you have a LEO-optimized rocket that has to guide the booster all the way back to the landing barge, I kind of doubt that it's going to be able to deliver a whole lot of payload up to higher orbits. It's going to have a lot of the same problems that Falcon Heavy has when it tries to reuse all of its stages, including the core stage. Without an expended core stage at its disposal, I have my doubts as to whether or not New Glenn is really going to be able to deploy a lot of payload up to geosynchronous orbit, meaning that New Glenn, for these types of contracts, may have to be an expendable rocket. That being being the case, it might end up being a very expensive rocket to use overall. Keep in mind that 7 BE-4s generate about 3.85 million pounds worth of thrust, whereas Falcon Heavy has over 5 million pounds of thrust at its disposal. And if both rockets are completely reusing all of their core stages, I can't imagine that either rocket is going to be able to get a lot of payload up to a higher orbit. Meaning, as I said before, we may have to have New Glenn in an expendable mode in order to be usable by the US Space Force. So once again, we are coming back to the same question. What is Blue Origin really bringing to the table here? I mean, if they have to use an expendable New Glenn, then is it just the volume? And is that really worth it to the US Space Force? Well, in my opinion, no. No, it isn't. And given the fact that we haven't seen New Glenn in operation at all yet, given the fact that Blue Origin still has not reached orbit, the US Space Force has nothing to base their decision on in awarding Blue Origin these incredibly lucrative contracts or at least the ability to bid on them. Then again, you could use the same logic for the HLS for Artemis. 
why the hell would you award such an important contract, the alternative HLS system to Starship, so in case Starship doesn't work out for some reason, this is the only other way that Artemis is going to be able to put astronauts on the surface of the moon, why would you award this responsibility to a company that has never been to orbit, let alone to interplanetary destinations? SpaceX has launched several interplanetary spacecraft at this point, and of course, ULA has launched a great many interplanetary spacecraft in its long history. So really, where is Blue Origin street cred? Well, I can find no justification other than the fact that the government just doesn't want to wage another war in the courtrooms with Jeff Bezos. Even though I think New Glenn does show a great deal of promise, especially as a reusable heavy lift rocket, Blue Origin has not earned the right to grab these types of high profile missions yet. They just haven't. If New Glenn had at least flown to orbit once or twice, I would have a different opinion about all of this. But they haven't. They're grabbing these types of contracts, these very lofty contracts that only go to the best launch providers without proving their capabilities at all. And that's something that makes me angrier than just about anything else. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, Please subscribe. Also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon and PayPal. Don't forget to turn on those notification bells. And as always, stay angry about space.